Federica Luchavero is a senior researcher in ethics and data at the Ethox Center and the Wellcome Center for Ethics and Humanities, which is part of the Big Data Institute at the University of Oxford. We are so lucky to have her today. Um, she is trained as a philosopher um, and her research covers the ethical aspects of the increasing introduction of IT, often in a healthcare setting, uh, but including the environmental and sustainability of big data. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, such an important topic for us all that I suspect that all of us, and include myself in this, engage with as fully as we need to in our own practice. So it couldn't be more timely, it couldn't be more urgent. I'd like to welcome Frederica to um, begin her talk. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jess, for the fantastic introduction. And thank you so much, everyone, for, for the invitation. I'm very thrilled to be here um and uh very happy to share you know my research with you uh, but also really to learn i'm really looking forward to the uh, discussion that uh, we are going to have at the end because um as uh, just said uh, i my, my my work is mainly in the field of um, healthcare and has been in the field of uh, healthcare and how digital transformations have changed healthcare um, but with this topic, and specifically on the uh, digital transformations and sustainability, of course, healthcare is one domain among many where we need to start this reflection. And um, and so it's uh, it's uh, I, I I'm I'm really looking forward to the discussion because um, I'm really interested in knowing how things are um, in your field. Um, and by the way, I love the fact that I can see like people from all these different countries uh, and I, I agree with Jess, it feels a little bit, a little bit like uh, traveling. Um, so um, when we think about uh, digital shifts, we often think about, uh, we often associate them as sustainable uh, and, and understand them as sustainable shift. And uh, we, um, we, we can say that we, we think about them as sustainable in two main ways. Uh, so uh, the, the first way is that we often refer to the fact that digital products or the, the digital projects um, can be shared and made reusable across time. So accessible by others uh, in time and space. So they are sustainable because they are capable of enduring. And it is, you know, the, the etymological meaning of, 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 and the, you know, the basic meaning of sustainability. They can be shared, they can endure through time. But very often we think about the sustainability of the digital shifts also in an other way. Um, and it is in a way that they uh, achieve a higher purpose. Um, so we often, either uh, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, refer to a, a, um, a broader idea of sustainability linked to the idea of endurance, but it's the idea of sustainable development. Um, and it's the idea that digital shifts are a way to achieve the goals of sustainable development. And with sustainable development, I take the definition um, uh, proposed in uh, uh, 1987 at the UN Convention um, that talks about sustainable development as a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation, generations to meet their own needs. And in thinking um, in, in that way, usually, um, I mean, in, the, in this definition, usually there are like three dimensions that are that belong to sustainable development that, that, let's say, articulate and explore the idea of what needs are. And usually people talk about uh, economic needs, um, social needs and environmental needs. So the idea, for example, in the case of digital products uh, or digital shifts is that they enable more people to access service um, and allowing for a, you know, a society that is uh, more democratic and uh, more just and um, uh, richer in a sense. Um, and also 
in the environmental sense, we think about digital shifts as a way to reduce carbon footprint. Um, because, for example, as we're doing now, we don't have to fly to meet for a meeting. Uh, we don't have to, um, you know, to, to move around. So we think also about the, uh, the carbon footprint of this um, as, as something like positive, as something sustainable. So, um, we see how this idea that digital shifts are sustainable or even uh, uh, that they foster sustainable development, we see that this idea is reiterated in many initiatives at the national and international level that foster the positive impacts of big data, of artificial technology, um, IT, uh, green IT programs and so on. And here I just put as an example, <clears throat> sorry, a report from uh, the um, of of of, uh, of a of a committee commissioned by uh, the UN in 2014 to write about the uh, the, the opportunities that big data initiatives uh, offer to meet sustainable development goals. Um, and a very interesting thing that I found when reading this report is that although they, it's, the, the report is very interesting in the way it discusses, like anyways, the challenges that uh, big data also pose to sustainable development goals in terms of inclusivity, for example, or the representativity of, of the people whose data are collected. One thing that is really missing um, is uh, the acknowledgement that uh, big data and digital technologies also have a, 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 a considerable environmental impact. So in that sense, they are also a threat to the same uh, value uh, of sustainable development that the, the report says that they, they will advance. So um, let's let's look a little bit in this in this issue. There is actually widespread evidence that digital infrastructures have considerable environmental impacts. We see that there is a growing annual digital demand with more than one million people coming online for the first time each day. Um, and although this can be welcome as a good thing uh, and a way to move beyond the digital divide, it also means that there are more devices connected to the internet, which is even going to increase if we think about how 5G technologies uh, are going to uh, you know, increase the amount of uh, sensors and devices that are connected to the internet uh, and are kind of surrounding us in our houses and in our environment, in our uh, physical environments. And that is expected by, you know, like to be fully in place by 2025. So according to some estimates, digital technology's share uh, of global CO2 emission has increased from 2.5 to 3.7% between uh, 2013 and 2018. This is a bigger impact on global warming than the entire aviation industry, uh, whose impact is 2.5% of in, in terms of emissions. So, um, there are different estimates, and this has to be said, and not everyone agrees with that. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that in a minute. Um, and uh, as well as um, there are be like different ways of trying to calculate the emissions produced by different activities. But if we think about, well, there is some quite some evidence that music and video screaming um, are uh, quite polluting, um, followed by, for example, Bitcoin mining, uh, that is an extremely like polluting activities. Um, I put some estimates there uh, just to give you a sense, of course, we should like look at the numbers and I'm aware of it, but just like to give you an example, uh, to give you some examples of, uh, of, 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 of the type of emissions that we are talking about. Um, also, more recently, uh, some, um, um, some researchers in the States have shown how uh, artificial intelligence models, like training one model for artificial intelligence can uh, emit five times, uh, can, have, can, 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 can be equal to the, like, the five times the emissions of a medium-sized American car. But, um, so where does this pollution come from? 
Um, by browsing the web or streaming videos, as you may know, we are constantly accessing data that are located somewhere, which is like in the data centers. And these data centers are large warehouses where data servers are located. And they are an important aspect of the material infrastructure that makes the internet. Uh, together with the pipes, transmitting uh, the pipes, the transmitting towers, um, they the idea is that there is this like very um, large and material um, infrastructure around all our digital activities um, that is not something like ethereal, something that uh, stays like uh, that according to some of our language, like the cloud language is something like a uh, fluffy out there. But it's actually like very industrial, uh, very um, uh, physical in a way, um, but not only requires a lot of space, um, data centers in particular also require large cooling system to cool down the rooms uh, with the servers that generate a lot of heat when processing data. And it is estimated that they use about 3% of the total global energy that is, uh, um, and, 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 and they say that this estimate is supposed to grow. But this is not all. Uh, so data centers and energy consumption of data centers are one aspect of digital pollution, what is called digital pollution. Um, other environmental impacts uh, are uh, related to um, other moments in the value chain of digital products. Um, for example, um, the damages to the biosphere due to the mineral extraction uh, that or, or the costs and emissions due to the manufacturing of uh, digital devices, uh, but also the emissions of toxic substances in the process of uh, disposing electronic um, yeah, in the process of, of disposing electronic products. And also, guess where all these pra practices conducted? Well, as the, the, the picture suggests, very often this happens in low and middle income countries where labor is cheaper and safety measures for workers are less strict, which also means that um, there are less restrictions on the uh, toxic uh, on the on the toxic emissions uh, and 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 um, and on, on how these emissions can be reduced. Now. Um, it is important, as I was saying before, to remember that there is no agreement on, in, on these estimates of uh, future emissions. Uh, why not? Well, because it is uh, very difficult to measure the overall impact uh, of uh, digital services and digital products throughout their life cycle. Um, as I was saying, we have to consider like the different aspects of it from mineral extraction to transportation to the factory where the, um, the devices are, are created and uh, to, to, to the transportation to, to the retailer to, to the actual use. So it's not just about the use. Um, we also need to consider that there are a lot of contextual aspects when we are, for example, um, uh, trying to calculate uh, emissions uh, that are um, very important to, to consider. Mm. And uh, for example, whether with the type of device people use to stream, for example, or to um, uh, the, the, the time of the day when they do it, the type of resolution and so on. And these all changes, of course, like the, the estimates of, of, the, of the energy consumption. Um, furthermore, there are um, rebound effects uh, that people say we should consider. And when I'm thinking about, uh, when I'm talking about rebound effects, I'm uh, talking about, I'm referring to the uh, unintentional side effects. Uh, that, um, uh, that, that that are linked to the the, the 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 use of digital services. So very often people um, give me the give me the the example of exactly like the example of of, of digitizing books, and they say like well. Um, you know, this is much more uh, sustainable and it's um, still, even if there are some emissions involved, there must be less than uh, the ones involved when, you know, going to the, 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 that you produce when going to the library by car. 
I always like to answer is like, yeah, first of all, you don't have to go to the library by car. Um, and um, more seriously is, uh, well, we, we, this, this needs to be calculated. And um, it's what seems obvious or what seemed obvious that uh, earlier on, um, it's not at the moment. Because, for example, as I was saying, we have to consider how this uh, how people behaviors uh, changes. So, for example, how people are more uh, keen than to uh, open up uh, more books and browse through more books, and then in that sense uh, use more data uh, and increase their digital uh, footprint in that sense. You know their carbon footprint through the use of digital uh, uh, tools in a way that it would be then less uh, environmentally costly if they just went to the library and they just looked at the books. Again, uh, this is this is this is just an example, and um, the the only, my, my only point. I'm, I'm not saying it is more uh, it is more polluting. What I'm saying is. Uh, we need to consider all these factors and how also like digital services have an impact on people behaviors. And um, we also need to consider that much data is not available because a lot of this is, of this is proprietary data. So like um, uh, companies will not let you access the data, uh, the, the, the consumption data about their data centers. And also the technology is constantly evolving. And this means that um, it will, um, yeah, it, it, what some calculations that work now will not work tomorrow or will, will not be adequate tomorrow. At the same time, one thing that uh, we know is that, um, in, in a way, the, the, like uh, studies have shown us that we cannot just rely on the technology to get better and say like, you know, there is more slow, there is uh, the reduction of the size of the chips is making things more efficient, making the energy consumption lower. So in the end, the thing will be solved by itself. Because even if, first of all, because it has been shown that actually uh, an increase in efficiency also brings a uh, an increase in use. An increase in use means an increase in in emissions in any in energy consumption in any ways. Mm -hmm. um, but also even taking into account the best possible estimates. So not the one I showed you before. They were like on the doom side. I, I will admit it now. Um, but uh, even if we take into account the best estimates, the industry still needs to reduce their emissions to zero in order to meet the Paris Agreement targets of keeping global warming below uh, two percent. Um, uh, to, um, uh, below uh, to the two degrees Celsius, and you see it in this um, in this uh, graph I'm showing, uh, where you see that the orange is the is uh, are the emissions, and even uh, sorry the uh, ICT uh, related emissions, and even if they remain the same as now, if all the global emissions need to lower, it means that they will uh, still be. At a very, um, I mean, the, the, the percentage with respect to all the global emission is going to be like high, even higher. Um, and therefore, it becomes like um, complicated because we will need to have like good justifications of why uh, the digital industry uh, is, uh, in what sectors of the digital industry are um, justified to spend more um, and to, 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 to emit more um, uh, carbon than the others. So the point is, uh, we need to do something about it. And what are we doing about this is uh, we have uh, several, um, several initiatives, uh, for example, the Clicking Clean reports by Greenpeace, these like third sector initiatives that have tried to increase consumers' awareness of the sustainability of the, dif of the different providers of IT services. And uh, but there have also been some uh, policy initiatives, both in the US and EU, uh, that try to create some rules for data centers emissions in order to reduce them. And finally, uh, there are some uh, self-regulation initiatives, like the one of the International Telecommunication Union, that are also setting goals for the industry to act uh, to. Uh, to act against greenhouse emissions. Despite this, however, 
what I've seen in my field work with uh, stakeholders in this area um, is that um, they feel that guidelines are still missing, that there is no direction from public bodies, there are no common standards, and that is uh, very much left to the, um, the willingness of the of these single businesses and markets to, to adapt to them or to, you know, to, to, to find some uh, more sustainable solutions. So people feel in general a lack of awareness and a kind of a responsibility void in this field. Now, as just told you, I'm, uh, my background is in philosophy and, and ethics, and as an ethicist and social and, and, and social sciences. Um, so I find this responsibility gap very interesting. Um, and uh, why? Well, because it allows us to uh, think um, broadly about this issue and think about, um, as I will show you in these slides, not only empirical questions about who is taking responsibility and how at the moment, um, and how are different roles allocated among different people in this field, um, but they also allow us to think about a normative question about who should take responsibility and how. Um, and uh, in a way, this uh, normative questions opens up a broader set of questions about uh, not only what are like practical things that could be done, and, and we'll get there um, in, in a bit, but also how you know, what is, for example, the role of um, institutions uh, in the context of this growing data economy and digitalization of our lives and how, uh, you know, how they're supposed to act in that, but also what are the roles and responsibilities and um, actions that individual citizens not, not only could, but should take and based on what criteria. So I found all these questions very interesting. Um, and, uh, and this is a little bit of the it's part, part of the work I'm doing. But there are just a few things that I, I like to discuss with you this both if you're interested at a you know more normative theoretical level, but also um, at the very practical level, really discussing what people in, in your sector, in your field could do. But before we go there, uh, let me just um, give you like few, I think, in, I mean, ideas that I, I found quite insightful when thinking about this issue. And um, first of all, um, when we think about responsibility, um, the image that most commonly comes to our mind is this one here. Uh, basically, it is about blaming somebody for some harm that they have produced on others and asking them to pay. So this is responsibility as understood in the uh, most traditional liability model. And um, this is prominent, this is the prominent legal model of responsibility and is used when we think about technologies related harms. But um, does it work when thinking about responsibility for environmental impacts of digital shifts? So my hunch is that it doesn't. And it doesn't, um, first of all, because there are some um, diffused, um, so because it is basically very difficult to uh, establish causal links between digital technology uh, the, uh, use and the use um, and the environmental impact. And it is a common problem in the discussion of responsibility for climate change, where um, we see images of um, climate crisis in parts of the world, and yet it is very hard to create a clear causal link um, with uh, some other practices happening in other parts of the world. So there are diffused effects and it's difficult to establish causal link, which doesn't help when thinking in terms of liability. Secondly, uh, when we think about liability, we usually think about um, making a causal link with something that happened in the past. So we think about it's like, usually like lawyers would say like ex, ex pop ex post, uh, so it's in a retroactive way, we look back. 
Um, when we think about environmental impacts and when we, especially like in the context of a digital transformation that are happening now, it's not really about looking back, but we want to look forward. We want to be proactive and we want to be prospective in the way we are thinking about responsibility. Finally, um, it is important when thinking about liability, you know, we're thinking very often in terms of structures and organizations where people have clear roles. Um, and again, and it, it's uh, clear how it's usually, okay, okay, at least it can be determined who has a, a responsibility to, what, to do what and what um, action was missed or uh, done that created harm. Now, um, in this context, it's, um, we have a lot of, in the digital context, we have a lot of actors. And um, so in a way like responsibilities are distributed among those actors. So we have talked about the infrastructure industry. Um, and so basically the industry producing, as I was saying, like the pipes, the data that, that go into the data center or, or the actual data centers and the servers and so on. And what is their responsibility in addressing issues of sustainability? Uh, but we also have the IT service providers and um, that could be like providers of platforms, uh, like digital platforms uh, to or, or, or you know, like platforms that help you digitize, um, digitize material uh, or that allow for video streaming or, you know, like Facebook or whatever. And um, it's interesting, I, I talked a lot with infrastructure industry and infrastructure industry, people were saying that in a way, at the moment, the issue is mostly on them rather than IT service providers. I haven't done any fact checking, so I need to finish my interview to actually establish whether that's the case. Uh, but again, there is this tension, at least, in who should do what and who should be responsible for what. Um, policymakers, everyone is lamenting that policymakers are not doing enough. Uh, and if they were, they probably <laughs> would la be lamenting that they would do too, they are doing too much and being too restrictive. But the point is, like, what are the responsibilities of the institutions to actually um, take a take control in this context and put some uh, rules and give some guidance instead of leaving it to the market? And how about the responsibility of the users of digital services and infrastructures? And with users, I'm thinking about the providers of the social services. For example, it includes the library, the libraries, because they are producing, they are using um, uh, digital service uh, inf and digital infrastructures to, of course, create another service. Um, but it's still they, they, can, they could be considered as like users, as well as the real like end users, like again. The, 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 the citizens, the individual, the person who is actually um, using the, 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 the products and what are, so shall we talk about the responsibility of uh, people to collect less data, to save, to, 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 to delete the data that they are, they are connecting or to stream less or to stream only in certain times of the day? Is it about them? And we see how in the uh, dealing with issues of climate change, we often um, uh, talk about individual responsibility and how also individual responsibility or how individual action can have a big role in, in the collective. Um, but again, well, you know, how, how we distribute this responsibility in this, this responsibilities in this context. And then the question is, so shall we think about new models of responsibilities and like collective action uh, uh, or think about collective responsibilities often like used in the environmental context, but would it be uh, appropriate in the context of the digital industry and the sustainability of the in digital industry? It's an open question for me, but um, just, just wanted to point out that there are other models besides the liability model. So um, I've seen that uh, I had like uh, notifications that people are probably like including um, ideas to the to the Padlet, uh, but please do add uh, your ideas to the Padlet, and we can um, we can we can discuss them. Um, and especially like ideas like who should act and and and, and also what can be done. Um, 
and it, specifically on what can be done, um, there is, uh, you probably received a link to the survey, right? Um, I don't know if uh, anyone has um, managed to have the time to, 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 oh yes, there are, I can see that there are some responses there. Please keep on adding to them. Um, I'll just like go um, quickly through them uh, because when we think about what can be done, we know, as I said, like as there are different actors, there are also like different things uh, that can be done. And um, for example, um, could be about collecting data on energy consumption, as I said, it is not enough at the moment. And, and then what does it mean to do it? Um, and oh, this is my timer, I've spoken says I'm spoken enough. Um, so what does it mean to do it at these different uh, different levels? So not only at the higher data center levels, but also at the level of a smaller organization who wants to know what is the, the, the energy consumption due to their digital activities. Um, but it's about, for, for example, it's focusing on digital infrastructure procurement and making sure that they are more sustainable, both when thinking about infrastructure, but also when thinking about IT services. Um, or uh, thinking about um, lobbying uh, for guidance to be provided by policymakers, because as, as I was saying, there are some actions that can be taken at individual or lower levels and others that will need to be uh, taken at higher levels. And somebody, you know, if policymakers are not addressing it, somebody will have to, you know, raise their awareness on this. Um, some people talk about cost, engaging in cost benefits analysis of digitalization and saying like, okay, what are the good things that come from it and what are the bad things in terms of environmental costs and can we weigh them? Um, and finally, um, it's about another, another way and it's not the only way and that's why uh, I left it with an open um, question was uh, introducing policies to ensure recycling of electronic devices, so tackling the issue of electronic waste. Um, I could be done now, but I'll just finish actually. And uh, by no means I need, I want to, um, I mean, I see there are like five people actually who talked about cost benefits analysis and I'd be like really interested in, in, in hearing their thoughts on that. Um, I must say I've, um, I've been thinking about this a bit because it's a very common um, approach in the, in, in the field of ethics and, 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 and healthcare. Um, but I, I, I see that there is, it's, it's, very, it's, it's very difficult uh, to work in terms of cost benefits analysis. And I just wanted to point out some issues with that, that very often these analysis are based on kind of uh, quantitative measurements. So, uh, you know, it's in, for monetary, in monetary ways, you can really say, okay, these are the costs of this operation and these are the benefits, just in terms of like counting the money. Really, um, in this context, um, it is hard, first of all, because we don't have um, data that is conclusive. Uh, so we are still making this analysis, but uh, the estimates vary a lot, as I was telling you before. Um, also, there is a need to engage in um, a discussion on benefits and drawbacks. So basically, it's like, what are the benefits? And who are these benefits from, for? Um, and this um, relates also to questions of um, question of, 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 of justice and social justice and how these benefits are distributing, distributed among people. Um, one the reason why I'm sometimes suspicious of cost benefit analysis, and please prove me wrong, is that very often you fall into a yes or no question. So the real question, um, I think, is how to reduce environmental impact and not saying like, OK, yeah, we have some benefits from digital technology, so we don't really that, that hard weight the costs of the environmental costs seems like it's that the, the problem is solved. Um, well, I think that keeping it a bit broader and thinking about, you know, how can the problem be solved? What can be done even like with little steps is better. And as I said, it's not a yes or no question. Digital technologies are there and are they to stay and they improve our lives in many ways. Um, and this is out of question. So the question is how do we make them more sustainable? All right, I think I've spoken enough. 
Um, thank you so much for your attention. And um, thank you so much, Frederica. That was absolutely wonderful. I was transfixed. Um, the, the time went slightly over, but it was it was brilliant, and that's <laughs> why I wasn't you know calling from the wings and saying, "Hey, stop!" I'm really great. Um, I am staggered by some of the figures that you are the estimates. And, and the rapid expansion of those. Um, I shouldn't be, but let's be honest, I am. Uh, and also fascinated by, you know, the stories we tell ourselves, you know, there's still these pervading myths about digital, uh, that it's automatically greener, often that it's also cheaper, uh, you know, all of these things, which I still hear in, in, in you know, conversations I'm in and, and talk about myth busting. That was absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open up to others in a moment, um, but I wonder just before I do so, whether I could just ask you to expand a little bit on that question of social justice that you touched on at the end, not least because that has been one of the themes of the Digital Shift Forum, looking at issues of digital and, and, and social justice, equity, inclusion and so on. So would you just expand on that, that relationship? Sure, sure. I went really quickly on that, actually. Um, the, the, the point there is, um, in, well, is basically that environmental and benefits and drawbacks are not um, fairly distributed uh, among populations and groups. And this is a fact, we know that we have been having like activists working on environmental justice for ages. Um, but we also need to think that uh, the, um, the, the digital, the, 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 the benefits and drawbacks of the digital revolution are not fairly distributed. And there are like several scholars working in the field of data justice and showing how, and you know, we were talking about myth busting, but, in, but how sometimes, you know, the, the rhetoric of digital access is good and it will be good for everyone and it will reach everyone is just not true when you look at things uh, in, in, in context. Um, and there are some populations that are disadvantaged by the huge collection of a lot of data on, on, on them and, um, and how this data is used, for example, for decision making. Um, or I'm, I'm, I'm thinking now about like surveillance systems and criminal justice and how are they used like in the, in the, in the, in the, in the that by, for policing purposes, for example. So um, again, uh, the, the point is, I mean, here I'm, I'm talking, you know, with you guys and people in a way trying to really use digital technologies in, um, in, in the best possible way. At the same time, there are those drawbacks and, and they're thinking about how they are distributed and not always thinking from the point of view of the richer countries. Um, as I was saying, it's like a lot of these environmental costs of, uh, for example, electronic waste uh, disposal and um, mineral extractions are on the shoulders of low and middle income countries. Um, doesn't mean that digital innovation is bad for them, um, but it means that we really need to, to think closely and think about like um, vulnerabilities and, and needs of all these different groups when asking these questions. That's so helpful. And I cannot tell you how much that is connecting to themes that have been running through other forums. Um, I am going to uh, begin to bring uh, our audience in in different ways, because I know there will be ways people wish to participate. Um, I'm going to ask um, my colleagues in the RL UK office to share the Mentimeter results. So why don't we start there by seeing what's come in. Um, and I'm going to give you a chance, Frederica, to kind of absorb what you're looking at. Um, and I wondered if you might just just sort of comment on, on what you're seeing there and if there's any surprises for you. Um, well, I, no, not really surprises. Uh, to be honest, it's the first time I, I, I was doing it and I was I, I was really curious. Um, and then I thought it was a bit unfair for me to say, well, the risk analysis probably it's not the best idea. And as I said, it's, it's just my, I, I, I really like to be proven wrong, pro proven wrong on that. Um, yes, I think like the collecting data in, in on energy consumption um, is, is very key uh, because that's what many people say. It's like, if we don't have awareness, how do we, how can we change things? Um, and uh, th there are methods and ways to do that. For people living in the UK, it's interesting how the, uh, the DEFRA, the, the, the Department of Environment um, and 
don't remember the full name, uh, but how they've been working out some um, guidelines to actually measure the, uh, to collect data of the government office and the use of digital uh, technologies. So there are like frameworks and methods to do that more and more. Um, but uh, but it, is, it, 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 is, it is an important question because it's the first point is to raise awareness um, and then to understand where consumption is and what can be done. Um, the lobbying thing, I think it is, um, it is, it is great. Uh, it is something that needs to be done. And again, it's part of like the building awareness um, and building awareness of the policymakers. I can't see the others be interested in uh, seeing or, okay, sorry. None at all. We, we just changed the screen. I was really taken with the relationship then between advocacy, lobbying and the data. Uh, as you said, one of these particular challenges at the minute, if the data is not available, it's not always easy to make the cases um, to the policymakers, to, to those who hold the purse strings. And, and yet, you know, what does that mean? You don't act until you know everything. It, it's, uh, you know, a, a, a really difficult point. So the other ones, the other seven there was about engaging in cost-based analysis around, um, particularly around digitization for activities and looking at policy making, uh, I guess, partly within our own libraries. Um, but I think we'll begin to open up some of this to um, asking our audience, particularly if there's anyone who has got experience about how they might be tackling these more directly within their own institutions, It'd be absolutely fascinating. Um, and so I think that I am going to, uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, why don't I um, see if we've got anyone who's able just to continue the theme we've got at the moment about um, actions we could take within our libraries and ask members if there's any member of the audience who's willing to kind of come in and talk about how as your own institution you may have been um, practically building in these considerations to your own IT strategy. Um, or if you've got ideas about how we could do that collectively, and I will come back to the particular questions in the Q&A, but let's just stay with this theme for a moment, if there's anyone who's able to do that. If not, I will start. I know there was a couple of people who, who had um, some ideas. I, I, there's a couple of things in the chat as well, um, which I think are really interesting, um, linking to this. Ah, you see, there is one of my, my willing participants, Stuart Lewis. Stuart, uh, thank you for, for, for coming in. Um, I know that at the National Library of Scotland, um, sorry, Frederica, meet Stuart uh, for the National Library of Scotland. Um, uh, wonderful talk we've had uh, so far, say Stuart. And I know that you're involved at the NLS in, in, in very active thinking around judicial strategy and its relationship to environmental sustainability. Is there an area you want to pick up on and uh, any kind of example that you can, you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, thank you very much. It was, a, it was a wonderful talk. I learned a lot and it really sort of, you know, does make us make us think it's, it's it's a great subject it's very timely for us to be thinking about within this community I, I suppose two things really came to mind for me the first is actually um, and I think this is going to be a big challenge for us within the library profession is we love going for gold standards we we really like to minimize risk wherever we can so you know purely from a sort of digital collections point of view you know we say well actually holding one copy isn't enough we're going to hold three copies you know and so we 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 don't do that with our physical collections, but we do do it with our digital collections. You know, we have much higher standards for our digital collections. You know, when it comes to digitization, you'll never hear a photographer saying, you know what, let's turn the resolution down a bit. We don't need that high resolution. But actually, you know, I think we're gonna to have to ask ourselves those, some of those hard questions um, because, you know, the climate emergency is a hard problem. And so as libraries, as librarians, archivists, whatever, are we willing, in a sense, to play our part and just turn turn those down, increase the risk a little bit um, in, in response? And that is a hard thing for us. But that was one thought. And then the other one I had was around actually to what extent we need to build infrastructure, um, which actually goes against a lot of what we've been saying. To, to solve some of these problems. So for example, a lot of our digi digitized collections, they're very hard to find. Um, a lot of our digitized collections contain duplicates where things have been digitized by multiple organizations. And so actually, is there any um, infrastructure we can be building? Um, people who've worked with me know probably the bit of um, work I'm talking about, but basically where we can um, get better at our digitization, sharing sort of how we do things, who's doing what and things so that we can make 
make those things that we do digitize more accessible and get more used by people, but equally reduce um, any sort of risk of duplication of effort and therefore duplication of storage and the associated costs. Yeah, thank you so much, Stuart. I think it's uh, it's 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 a very interesting point, and and in in a way that I mean both both points and um, both the idea that that of course I mean um, you 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 want to provide like high quality material and also uh, to make sure that it is available and making it also sometimes like redundancy is a way to make it available. And I, I want to say this is for example the way also like the video streaming industry works. Um, in the sense that in order for people across the globe to uh, have access to the whatever song, uh, they have to store the song like in many different um, data centers in order for it to be to be available, to be available high resolution and so on. So my point here is also um, it's that if on one hand it is important to like that everyone takes this uh, into account, it's also important to to, of course, uh, evaluate all the different situations. And um, I, I, I came across a project that was inter very interesting, called, was called the Digital Archive. Um, and uh, the idea of, of this was an, a project of, of two artists. And what they were trying to do was like to uh, save all the artistic work that was, um, that would otherwise be deleted from the internet and from the archives. Um, on internet because nobody really cared or nobody would find them profitable. And um, what really made me think is that um, we should probably also like in getting this like broader conversation or what are the things that maybe are worth being redundant and are worth being um, uh, being being saved. Uh, so maybe saving those digital projects, that those artistic projects um, in digital format was a good thing because it was living like an heritage um, and, uh, and 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 keeping that heritage alive. Um, while there are other things that that may be reduced uh, without, uh, but again, those other things that could be reduced, maybe there are some 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 other interests that that will protect them. So in that sense, opening up the discussion and as you say, like thinking also about how can we achieve our goals in with more sustainable infrastructures and more sustainable technologies, it's something that. Um, as I said, it's important to start and it's important to lobby for it because when you get, you will be asking this at your service providers, they will have somehow to deal with this question even just at the business level. Um, and this, uh, you know, this creates like a domino effect in, in that sense. Um, so um, I think it's, it's, it's about both. I mean, my, my intention is not to demonize, uh, you know, all the kind of digital fantastic like work that is being do, done in, in all in that in different sectors, you know, digitizing products and, and projects and so on. Um, it's really about, um, as, as you say, like, you know, making, making this thing, um, making people aware and then thinking about how this can be done and when it should be done and when not. So just really to start the discussion in, in, in a way that it's broader and not just um, done by the few. I'm, uh, I, I would like to just let the two of you carry on talking and I'm very tempted to do so, but I just want to give the others a chance if they want to join us. We have got a couple of uh, extra slots free. Uh, there's no pressure to do so, but if you do want to raise your hand and just come and join, ask a question in person or, or make a comment, then, you know, you, you can see it's a friendly group. So, you know, ignore the round, people around the world, just uh, talk to us and uh, we'd love to love you to come in. Um, I am really struck by the conversation the two of you have just had. Um, uh, Stuart will, will smile with me when we reflect on how long it's taken us as a sector to really uh, take seriously models around, you know, sharing print, getting to genuinely collaborative approaches to sharing that physical material, and often talking about the shift to digital as one of the opportunities that allowed us to do that, um, and the real risk of us not uh, allowing this uh, topic, this theme, this risk that, that has been um, so brilliantly articulated today as one of the drivers for a paradigm shift, if you like, in how shared access, shared ownership, shared infrastructure could be one of the ways in which we take responsibility in our own houses. Uh, one for all UK, I think, to take Let's away. Say on the Padlet, I can also see like some, um, you know, some uh, people going in that direction, like on like making like similar um, comments. And I, um, and, and, and uh, 
I think it, I mean it's uh, I'm not very good at multitasking, but if anyone who wrote in the Padlet that also like with more critical views like to, to jump in, I think it would be like interesting. Oh, that's uh, great, and I mean, we've of, seen a lot of like interesting suggestions or or insights in there. Yeah, I think we're going to have a whole other session coming out of this one. But uh, let me first uh, introduce and say thank you to Guy Baxter for joining us. Absolutely lovely to have you joining us on the screen, Guy. Um, is there a comment or, or question you want to raise? Yeah, it was a comment really, but I thought it was a really interesting point, um, Federica, that you just made about archives, actually. I'm an archivist at University of Reading. And um, and archives are often thought of, uh, archivists are often thought of as people who, um, so I'll, I'll bring that down in case it might get better volume. Um, archivists are often thought of as people who hold on to things. Archivists are people who get rid of things. That's what archivists do and what archivists have traditionally done. That's why when, when you, when you, People are often shocked when they see the statistics about how many government records actually end up in the National Archives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what you're talking about is a call for better records management in the electronic realm and, and, and more archival appraisal in many ways and actually making those decisions that people have been making with paper collections for a very, very long time. But the digital presents us with a big challenge. And I suppose that one of those things is is we don't have the tools and the, the instincts that allow us to make those selections. Uh, and it's just easier, isn't it? It's easier to say, well, let's just hang on to it all. Um, we don't have to build a warehouse. And what you're saying is actually, we are building a warehouse. We're building a, uh, we're building a warehouse that you know, could be hugely damaging. We're building lots of warehouses. They're just full of servers, not full of, um, not, not full of, uh, uh, of paper records. So it feels like this is a call for kind of more records management. I just wondered whether, that's something that is is coming through. Um, obviously, this is an RO UK forum. Where this is coming through, um, particularly internationally, in archival forums as well. Yeah, I, it, it's that's a fantastic point, and I I'm not sure I can. Um, I, I, I mean, I answer the question about the the, the archives. Uh, what I can say is that I think you you really hit um, a very important point when you say that um, it's. It's basically it, it, it is the same, um, and it is true that in 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 an archive you can see physically uh, the papers and the amount of stuff, and then you say like, okay, we we, we need to 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 manage this. Um, the fact that you cannot see it in the digital realm doesn't mean that it's not there, um, and and it can be accessed and it can be. Uh, you know, like arranged and managed. Uh, so, as you said, it's, it's a shift in perspective. Um, that's uh, that, 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 that's that, that's the main point. And I think it's yeah, the it's 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 a brilliant uh, way of putting it. Like uh, you know, comparing it is it is part of the world of uh, uh, the archivist or, or yeah, like data manager. Yeah, I think it's a great point, Guy. I was really struck, like yeah. you and Federica were speaking about the the kind of roles of curation, deletion, you know, yeah. letting go, all of those things which are embedded in 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 how you know we do our practice. Uh, I don't know either about what the connection um, is in terms of discussion with the wider archival community, but what strikes me um, is that there's a couple of people picking up on on that area of interest in the chat, uh, and maybe it's a challenge back to our UK in thinking about um, you know how we connect that with our partners in TNA, who I'm sure are having this conversation uh, the national archives Federica and I'm sure they, they will be uh, but also in our conference we hold jointly across the communities DCDC an annual conference which brings together archives cultural collectors cultural uh, sector museums uh, libraries and others and I think this could be an area that I don't think we talked about there and it would be a really rich one to do so. Um, I know we've got a couple of questions in the chat um, and I uh, I'm not sure how technical you're going to want to get, Frederica. So forgive me. These might be just whether there are whether there are quick answers or one of them is what is the role of quantum computing in this issue, and, and has it a contribution to make? Yeah, I mean, um, in in principle, yes. In practice, we are far away from that. So yes, quantum computing addresses exactly this issue of uh, space and um, energy consumption, uh, but how close we had to that mm, people have been talking to the like who are more of experts that mean this don't are not very confident that this is going to happen yeah that that's really helpful and the other one was can you say a little bit more about how these practices might be built to digital infrastructure procurement well, um, it's um, this is something that some of these government the government offices are looking into, and um, so it's 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 really about uh, asking. Um, I mean, 
asking the, the infrastructure providers to, uh, to, to deal with this issue and choose those infrastructures that are actually, um, you know, uh, be, being sustainable. Um, and this can be done in several ways because depending on the infrastructure, depending on the service. So it really depend, depends on pro, uh, procurement for what. So if it is procurement for e-waste uh, disposal, so it is about to try to understand how these companies will uh, proceed to uh, dispose uh, electronic devices. Um, if it is about procurement for IT services, so it is about trying to understand what is the, uh, you know, their, their sustainability um, uh, plan. And in terms, not only, uh, you know, as a company, but also in terms of the, the data centers that they use, because there are different data centers using different technologies located in different places. And depending on this, there is like, there are, they have like different uh, consumptions and, and, and emissions. Um, so um, as I said, uh, I, I, it, it, is, it, is, it is broad, uh, it is technical, uh, and I probably am not be even able to go much farther than this. Um, and this is why I'm trying to study this issue more uh, because I think it is important to also provide people with tools. Um, so, and say like, okay, in terms of procurement, what is that I can do? But these are, you know, at least like some initial questions that one can uh, address and think about when engaging with uh, with providers.